Okay, directors, this is a template for a shot list. Uh, I do this on uh, Google Sheets, but if you have Excel, you basically can do this in Excel. Any spreadsheet software that you use, you just basically create columns and rows and just fill in the shot list, right? So the critical important things that you need in regards to shot lists are the shot numbers, is it interior or exterior, who's in the shot, what camera angle you're using, does the camera move, and hold on, let me just, there we go, that's better, what's the coverage, and any notes. And on production, you can write down what takes you like. So you can print this out and write it on paper. This is what I did with the season three, episode two, Tricks and Treats, which is on our YouTube channel. It's our Halloween episode again. And this is where I take what was in the script and I break it down into shot lists. The thing to remember about shot listing is that the scene number is the number of the scene. So every shot starts with the scene number. So for scene one, scene two, scene, that's why it's important when you change the script from spec format, which has no scene numbers, to shooting script format, which has the scene numbers. That will reference the scenes. And each scene is between the slug lines. The next time in the script it says interior or X -E -I -N -T or EXT, that's a new scene. Within those scenes are shots. And the standardized way that a lot of Hollywood productions do it, and it's the way I do it too, because it makes sense, is to use letters. So you always start with scene, uh, shot one. And a lot of times, depending on your setup and your blocking for the scene, that's going to be your master. That's going to be your wide shot. It's going to cover everything in the scene. And you may run that scene when you are shooting all the way through. You may cut it halfway because you know at that point you're not going to be using the master, but that's your job as a director is to decide how much of the scene do you really need. Sometimes it's cost effective to just shoot the whole thing and to just cut it later, especially if it's like, well, I'm not sure how I want to cut it. I want to have a lot of options. So I'm going to break up my shots and then I'm going to shoot each shot all the way through, all the way through, all the way through, because there are going to be moments in the close-ups, like you take a close-up of an actor, they're not talking the whole time. The other actor who's off camera for that setup is going to be talking to them, but they're going to be reacting. So you're going to want to have enough of that footage to where you can cut back and forth in the edit between reactions and, and tell your story. In this scene, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten shots. Well, this isn't a shot. This is, I just put a note down here, room tone. I have one A. 1B, C, D, E. So every new setup, every time you move the camera and you get a new angle, that's a new shot. All right? You can do the whole scene again. You can just do just specific coverage. But like I said, depending on your, your time and your scheduling, which we did in the last video about, you know, setting up your synchronized schedule, you're going to figure out how much time you actually have to shoot and you're going to be more cost effective more economical with what you're actually going to shoot all right so for example uh in that darn girlfriend and you can actually like pull the video up and follow along with each shot and you can figure out which shot is which the first shot every episode our formulas we always start off with what i call a a steady cam shot i mount our camera on a little uh handheld rig that allows me to, and now that we're shooting on the phone, I don't really use a rig, but um, you just keep it as steady as possible. And we just get a moving shot. And it's Valerie, uh, I'm behind the camera, so I don't have to worry about, I don't have a cameraman, so that's always the first shot. All right, then we have, for this particular episode, I wanted to shoot Vic first, because then I could focus on Valerie more. So uh, 1A and 1B were different angles, different framings of the same basic setup, right? 1A, that's more medium. So it was wider so you could see some of the decorations on our walls. And I covered all of Vic up until the point where, hey, here's our first trick-or-treater. 
1B was tighter, was a medium close-up. That way you can see my face more. And then I'm done with Vic for that particular section. Now we go to Valerie, Pamela, Pamela's character. So that's 1C. So we, the camera goes to the other side. Now it's covering her. I get her all the way up to the doorbell because once the door rings, the scene changes. Then we gotta, then we gotta get a little bit wider and we gotta cover us going to the door. So what I did was I added a shot, 1D, which was a two shot. So me and Pamela were in the shot and then just shows her in a wider shot. So it's a two shot, which, you know, both actors are gonna be in it. So it's gotta be wider, it can't be a close up unless they're right next to each other. But because she's going to open the door, it's gotta be wider. And I cover her opening the door. In the finished product, I only use, as soon as she starts to open it, I then cut to my insert shot so you can, otherwise I would have had to do a moving mask because the character is CG as she opens the door. I would have had to do a lot of comp compositing for that shot, which I knew I wasn't gonna use the whole thing. I, I, I shot it as an option in case that looked better, I would have used it and I would have done all the CGI work that needed to be done to make it work. But you know, when you're shooting it, you just shoot it, you can cut it in post. When you're editing, you can determine timing and tempo and that's, some, but it's important to have this shot list because it allows you to um, have plenty to work with, right? That's what you're doing. You're laying down a map, you're getting everything you need and then you'll play with it in post-production. That's, that's fun, I love doing that. At any rate, uh, one thing to note, you notice these two shots here are green. That's to let me know that I need to use CG for those, okay? 1E, which we used in the finished product, the whole shot. This was, the camera was outside the door looking into the apartment and it was at a low angle because Charlie Brown's a kid and also it allowed me to frame the background well to hide a lot of things that, to just it comp compositing, composition wise I should say it looked much better all right and then you got 1f that's the background plate for CG so technically this should also be uh, green that's the wrong color green there we go nice and white yeah so that should be green too because that was that's where I put the CG Charlie that was the one shot of him as the door opened you revealed him that's that shot background plate no camera movement. Once you move the camera, if you're gonna have a CG character, now you have to use motion tracking. So here's a good tip. If you wanna put CG and you don't have that much time or patience or knowledge, uh, keep the camera on the sticks. Keep the camera on the tripod. You don't always have to move the camera. Uh, then we got 1G. 1G, okay, this is not a picture. This was just Pamela doing Charlie Brown's lines from his POV. So Pamela actually went out on the porch and did Charlie Brown's lines. So it would sound like, and if you listen to the finished episode, it does not sound like she stood in front of a microphone in a, in a voiceover booth to do it. She was there on set doing it. And I just basically like mixed it in post. Okay, so that's, and it, that was a great trick. That's another thing too. Get your wild, This so this is what they call a wild, a wild track, but I call it one, one DG. Uh, why did I call it one DG? I think uh, I, it was actually one G. Something happened here. <laughs> okay, that's what it was. On the slate, it was one G. It wasn't one DG. No, no, it wasn't. Um, but the reason why I named that shot, even though it was, when I import all this stuff into HitFilm and I'm looking at my media and it has the slate, I'll look at the slate, reference this shot list and go, ah, that's what this is. Here's my 1G. And then you have what takes that you use. So you can, that's why it's important to, to mark everything with the slate. Even if you don't have a clapboard, right? You don't have the one that goes, makes that clap sound just use a, a dry erase board and just write this information down so that you can you can uh, use it to index your your video files all right then we have an insert shot 
So anytime you have an insert shot, which is an extreme close-up of a particular item, and we, we needed to show Valerie picking up the rock, so that's what this was. And it was handheld because it's easier to frame it. You know, if you, you're doing an insert shot, a lot of times it's quicker to just go handheld, right? She picks up the rock, go handheld to grab a close shot. There you go. Okay, and then room tone. When you're done shooting a scene, before you move on to a different location, make sure you grab room tone. 30 seconds. Uh, if you are recording with a camera and an audio recorder, like a dual system, which is when you would need to have a clapboard, then you know your sound guy, sound person, is going to uh, ask for the room tone. Any competent sound person is going to remind you, but it's good to know that, hey, I need room tone. Don't forget room tone. Because what happens is, whenever you're looking at a rough cut and you're cutting back and forth, the sound changes. Why? Because the mic's in a different position. Room tone allows you to get that, like if you listen really closely, if I'm quiet for a moment, you can kind of hear the room tone of what I'm recording right now. So listen to this. Okay, so this, that bed, that very soft rumbling in the background of the refrigerator, maybe you can hear the clock ticking. A lot of people, they don't want to have that. They want clean audio, and if you have the capability to get clean audio, that's fantastic. But having it is not necessarily a bad thing because you can bed it underneath and it will mask the audio the Doppler shifting of the sound as the camera is changing position from shot to shot to shot. Moving on. Okay, so scene two was all exterior. These are both CG shots. So you got, as you notice, two, two A. Two shots for that. Scene three, three, three A. So as you can see, you know, it's got all the shots listed. So that's basically, in a basic thing, you just want, this is all you need. This is all you need, minimum right so I'm gonna show you another shot list this one's for cyber fighter I have a lot more information here because I'm going to be uh, this is a much more ambitious project um, this one I've actually am trying to figure out the timing for it so this information is not necessarily that important but the template that I used had it so I used it so this one I in, uh, added a column for CG elements so that I could oh because there's going to be a lot of a lot of uh, virtual sets for this and so CG elements is important but here's my shot number notice again one one a one B one C D E F okay into your exterior here's what I added focal distance this is for my DP um, I use a pre-visualized software called frameforge which generate storyboards but allows you to previs. You can actually create a set, and I'm gonna show that to you in a future video of how I work with Frameforge, but you can actually create a 3D set that that matches the dimensions of your actual set. So you can play around with camera setups. So you can actually see, well I can't put the camera there because there's a wall. And this is as far back as it's gonna go. And so when you go to the location, you'll save a lot of time. You do all this stuff in prep, you don't have to worry about it uh, when it's, you know, shooting day, because that's, you, you lose time really quickly on set, okay? I only had focal distance for that one shot, because I need to go through with my DP when I hire them to figure out what the other ones are gonna be, right? Subject, angle, extreme, long shot. Lens, here's another thing too, that can be important. What kind of a lens? What what's the you know millimeter are you are you shooting with? The equipment. I'm gonna jim jib or gimbal. I think we're gonna be shooting with the gimbal. We're gonna be shooting with the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera, which is a great camera and it's lightweight. Stick that thing on a gimbal. You have a crane. You have a dolly. You have a steady cam. You got everything you need instead of all this other extra equipment. Camera movement. This is what the camera's gonna do. Coverage notes so and this other you know script time setup time that you, you can if you want if you want to do that but i just wanted to show you lens and focal distance which 
is important. See, some of these other shots that I actually have the focal distance, I got that from Frameforge. You know, you go through this shot list with your DP. Your DP is going to let you know if there's anything that you are missing. Uh, but if you are a director who is also a DP, chances are you've got it all. You got pretty much everything you need. But keep in mind too with the shot list, um, the shot list will change, right? The shot list can change on set. But anyway, these are an example of the shot list. You know, a little bit of a sneak peek at what we're doing with Cyber Fighter. It's a short, but look at all that. That's a lot. That's a lot we're doing. So yeah. Pre-visualization is very important. Having that shot list planned out before you get on set will let you make changes on the fly because you need to have a roadmap of where you want to go before you can start adapting it. Everything's going to change on the set, right? You're going to have unseen problems. Things pop up. Oh, you didn't get that equipment. Oh, this angle doesn't work. You have to shoot from here. Oh, we're running out of time, so we have to lose some shots. If you have a shot list, you have a place to start, you can adapt the shots, you can change the angle, you can renumber them, but without that shot list, you're trying to do it on your head, that's impossible unless you're going to do a static shot. If you only got one shot and you're not doing any other setups, yeah, feel free to ignore this advice, but if you're shooting something and even if you're only shooting for one day, it really pays off to plan out a shot list. So. In future directorial 101s, I want to talk to you about storyboarding and other director things, like also pre-planning your sound design before you even go in front of the cameras. How novel is that? Doing your post-production in pre-production. Huh. Anyway, stay tuned. Be sure to like and subscribe these videos. Uh, be sure to you know give me some comments. Are you enjoying this? What do you want to see more of? You know, what do you want me to make a video about next? And let me know. And I will see you in the next episode.